Hey there, my name is Zach and I've been coding for about four years now. And in this video, I wanna share the three things that I made, you know, the three mistakes that I made teaching myself to code in hopes that maybe you won't make them too. The first mistake that I made was not giving enough respect to front end development. And what I mean by that is when I, you know, first started to learn to code, I was reading, you know, all of your classic things like what language do I learn? Um, what's the difference between front and back end development? What's a full stack developer? What's DevOps? You know, all of these questions had come into my mind and I was reading resources that, you know, I guess were telling me that front end development was a bit easier, or at least that's the impression that I got. And so I took that impression and just kind of concluded that, oh, front end development is the easier one. I don't want to do that. I want to do the back end stuff, which is hard. And I could not have been further from the truth here. Um, it turns out that front end development has a ton of things going on with it. And I would argue that it may even be a little bit more di difficult than back end development at times. Now, I'm not trying to sway you one way or the other. But basically what I'm saying is that as you're choosing, you know, what discipline within software engineering that you're going to get into, don't put any bias on uh, the different disciplines. They're all hard in their own uh, respect. And I'll give you an example here with front end development. So like I said, I kind of thought that this was the easy part of coding, but in reality, there's a couple different uh, dimensions to this. The first component of front end development is going to be the design component. So this doesn't have anything to do with code at all. And you could hire someone who is it literally just a graphic designer to do this part of the project. So all this is, is basically taking your web app and putting it in something like Photoshop or Adobe XD, which is kind of a, a wireframing software. And what you're doing here is basically mapping out the user experience and showing what is this going to look like on a mobile device and a desktop device. And this takes a long time. And especially for me, who I'm not great at designing, you know, I can get something together, but it's totally agonizing for me to go through this process of designing. But it is very important, which we're actually going to talk about here in the next point. But anyways, that is the first piece of front end development. And the second piece is actually taking that design and creating a web application out of it, turning that into actual code. And when you're doing that, there's a lot of things that you have to think about. And I'll give you a very specific example of how front end development can get a little bit challenging. And it's actually something that I experienced in one of my own web apps. So I have a golf training application that goes along with my golf blog. And what this allows you to do is not only take my premium training courses, kind of like a Udemy or something like that, uh, but it also allows you to enter your golf round statistics. And for those of you who haven't played golf or anything, basically when you go to the course and you play 18 holes of golf, each hole, you track your statistics. So did you hit the fairway? Did you hit the green? And how many putts did you take on a single hole? And so my app allows a golfer to track all of those things um, for each of their rounds. When I built this component, I was thinking, you know, I, I wasn't really thinking about the user experience enough. And what happens is as you're clicking through um, the statistics entry for each hole, you can click the buttons, but you'll see as we click the buttons, there's a little tiny lag. And if I were to go into the Chrome developer tools and you know artificially slow down the network, basically simulating a slow Wi-Fi connection, you'll see that as we start clicking these buttons again, it's even slower. And this is a terrible user experience because you know, the user's probably wondering why is this, you know, web app lagging like this? And the reason that this is happening is because it takes a few milliseconds to actually, you know, take that click that the user has done and translate in that into an action that modifies the database on the back end. 
and this is what we call an asynchronous operation and so it's going to take a few milliseconds but as a front-end developer what you have to do is basically work around that and do something called an optimistic update in the ui and so what i'm saying when i say optimistic update is basically you know when the user clicks a certain button which fires a database action on the back end i want to assume that it is successful and you know we'll assume it's successful so that that value or that button changes immediately and then if we do end up having problems we'll just revert it back to the previous value and notify the user that something went wrong and so that is a much better user experience than what we saw a little bit earlier where clicking the buttons has a little bit of a lag Something like this is a perfect example of how, you know, front end development is uh, not actually that easy and it can be very challenging at times. You're not only having to code, but you're having to get into the mind of the end user and figure out how are they going to be using this application. So to me, I think that's very stimulating and I think it's a really fun part of development to, to really think through those things. And you don't necessarily have to do that on the back end. So that would be number one. I think giving more respect to front end development and just in general taking the bias out of my decision of what to go into and giving the respect to every different discipline within software engineering I think if I did that, I would have been a lot better off. Now, the second thing that I think I would have done differently, the mistake that I made, is not spending enough time in an object-oriented programming language. Now, I jumped into JavaScript pretty early on. I, I had started out with C for a few months, and then I moved into Python for a few months. And then I jumped into JavaScript because that is basically the programming language of the web. And what I wanted to do was build web apps. So obviously I had to get into JavaScript development. Now doing so made it a little bit dif difficult for me because if you are classically trained and you're not self-taught like me, you'll most likely go through at least some sort of C++ or Java uh, you know, computer course during college or, you know, at a boot camp or whatever. And these languages naturally have more object oriented programming uh, paradigms within them. What object oriented programming is, is basically taking the real world and mapping it to your code. And this allows you to kind of think about your code in a little bit more logical fashion, something that makes sense to the human brain rather than the computer brain. And so a good example of this is um, we'll think about the golf app that I created. Uh, within that golf app, I have a training portal where people can go in and take courses. And so within that web app, um, you have different pieces of it. So you have not only the video, uh, but you have the course itself and the section uh, and then the lesson that the section is in. These are all the nouns of this web app. And within these nouns, they have different verbs or actions that they can do. So for, we'll say for a, a training course, uh, on that training course object, we can create a new course or we can add a section or something like that. And I know this is probably not making sense to someone who's just starting out, but ultimately, like I said, object-oriented programming is taking the real world and mapping it to our code so that we as humans can kind of make sense of it a little bit better. And with object-oriented programming comes what we call design patterns. And these design patterns are useful ways to think about designing our code. They're, they're basically reusable patterns that have been tested over time by many developers and are known ways to solve different uh, coding problems. And so the reason that I say I wish that I would have spent a little bit more time in an object-oriented programming language is because with those programming languages, you learn things about, you know, these, these objects or these, uh, not objects, but classes and the static methods on the classes and things like polymorphism and, 
all of these object-oriented programming concepts, you'll learn coding in those languages. And if you start out in JavaScript, which technically does not have the concept of object-oriented programming, um, you'll be a little bit confused because in newer versions of JavaScript, there are actually, you know, things called classes and static methods and things that are supposed to emulate, um, you know, object-oriented programming languages. But in reality, JavaScript is not, you know, anything like this. It's fundamentally different. And so you can really get confused as a developer starting out um, when you're trying to apply these object-oriented programming concepts to the JavaScript um, language. I know that this probably didn't make a whole lot of sense first time around, but in summary, what I'm saying is that if I had to start over, I wish that I would have um, spent a little bit more time in a programming language such as either Python, Java, or C++. And if I know, if I kind of knew what I know now back then, I would probably have gone with Java because I think that nails these concepts home um, the best. And what I would do is not only work a little bit in Java, you don't have to spend you know, the rest of your programming career in it, but I'd work a little bit in Java and pair that with two books. Um, the first one is called Head First Object Oriented Analysis and Design. And the second one is Head First Design Patterns. They're written by the same people, and although the covers look very cheesy, and as you're reading it, it's very cheesy, I think they are excellent ways to get introduced to the concepts of object-oriented programming and understanding what is the goal of it. And just as a forewarning, um, as you get into object-oriented programming, you're probably gonna read someone on the internet who's ranting about how bad it is, how they don't agree with it and stuff like that. But don't worry, um, this is just an internet argument that has happened for many years now. And I promise you that if you learn the concepts of object-oriented programming and you, you know, practice them and learn how to apply them correctly, then it will help you as a developer long term, even if you don't end up, you know, programming in a language like Java and moving over to something like JavaScript, which is literally all about objects, but not object oriented programming. And the third and final mistake that I made was not having a great planning process prior to either writing an app or just a feature of an app. When you're programming, you oftentimes will get into a situation where you have this idea of what you want to create, but then you just start, you know, typing code out and eventually you get lost because you haven't planned to the end of this. And so what I would have done if I kind of had to start over from the beginning is I would have emphasized this a little bit more. And not only that, but I would have tried to stay as close to the middle on this concept as possible. What I mean by that is basically not planning too much, but not failing to plan at all. Let's say that you are wanting to create the infamous to-do app, which is the most overused example of software development um, that you could ever find. You know, every tutorial is gonna teach you how to do a to-do app. Now, if you're trying to create this from scratch, you obviously have to plan it out. And what I mean by plan it out is you have to decide what is it gonna look like? Um, you know, what languages are you gonna use? Um, how are you going to construct the API and how is that going to talk to the database and how is the front end going to talk to the back end? All of these things are, you know, decisions that you have to make beforehand. And then furthermore, as you actually get into writing this, you know, you'll have to implement different, uh, you know, methods or functions. And even with a small function, it's helpful to kind of sketch out what logic you want um, this function to do. So what we call that is pseudocode, and it's basically saying, you know, I wanna write out in plain English how I want this method or function to work. You know, planning these things out is very important, but also I would not plan it out too much, and this is another mistake that I've made, you know, on the flip side, where 
I'll try to plan out my entire app. I'll try to plan out every last thing before I start to code. And the thing that's wrong with that is the fact that if you don't know everything about your web app, then there's no possible way that you can plan out everything about it. Now, if you're an experienced software developer, um, then it's gonna get a lot easier to plan further into the future. So as your skills increase, your planning abilities also increase and you can be more confident about the things that you're planning out in your web app or even just a feature of that web app. Although this is definitely a personal preference and my own personal method for doing it, what I have found to be most useful for me is starting with the UI. So when I say that, I mean starting with the user interface and the user experience. I wanna actually sketch out on paper what this web app or feature is going to look like and I want to arrange it on the page. Here's what it looks like on the desktop. Here's what it looks like on the mobile device. And then when the user clicks certain things on the page, here's what it's going to do. And so I find this extremely useful because um, it helps you foresee, it helps you kind of predict um, programming problems that you're gonna run into down the road when you wanna implement a different user feature. So I like to start out with the front end and not code at all. And then from that, once I'm happy with what it looks like, and it depends on how complicated we're getting, you know, are, am I planning out an entire web app or just a simple feature, I'll spend more or less time on this uh, sketching process. But once I have that, once I have a good idea of what the user experience is gonna look like, then I go through the page and I actually map out okay, when the user clicks this, I need to have a function that runs and updates the database or something like that. And so I basically work from the front end all the way to the back. And so that's my personal preference. And I found myself for many years kind of not having this structure for you know how I actually approach problems. So sometimes I would start out by implementing the back end API methods, or sometimes I'd design the database first. Sometimes I would do the front end first, but it was never repeatable. And it was kind of, uh, you know, up in the air. It was completely random as to where I started in the process. So if I had to do it differently starting over, what I would recommend is trying to come up with that workflow for yourself and sticking to it. You know, sticking to the process of, okay, I want to start on the back end and then work my way to the front end, or let's start on the front end, work my way back, or even better, and this is probably more realistic and probably more representative of my own method, is let's start on the front end, let's implement a lot of it, but not all of it, then we'll go to the back end, implement you know some of it, and then we'll kind of try to connect them, and then we'll polish off each piece of the you know web app. And so that's probably a more realistic way to do things, where you're kind of jumping between the two. Now, if you are you know, coding as just a front-end developer where that is your only job and you let someone else do the back-end development, then this is not quite as hard. But if you're looking to get into full-stack development, which is kind of what I do, um, you'll have to come up with that workflow of you know, putting on these different hats. And ultimately, you're doing three, four, five, or even six different jobs that individual people could be doing but you're doing it all at once. You really have to get good at putting on those different hats and saying, okay, now I am doing front end development. And then, you know, putting on a different hat and saying, okay, now I'm on the back end and I'm not worrying about the front end. So really isolating those pieces while, you know, thinking about how they're all connected to each other is super important and is something that I wish that I would have done. So those are the three things that, the three big mistakes that I think that I made when I was uh, learning to uh, code and teaching myself to code. Now, I know that most of them probably didn't make 100% sense, and that is okay. These things should not make sense starting out, um, but I wanted to share them just as something to keep in the back of your mind to be aware of as you're trying to make decisions along the way as you're learning to code. So if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more content just like this. And if you have any questions or comments, drop them in the comment section below.